Hello everyone, and welcome to the first episode of The State of Repairs. This is an all-new podcast that focuses on the repair industry, where we talk about the inner workings of repair shops, how business owners are running their stores, and the stories that they have from their time in the industry. For our very first episode, we'll be talking to the owner of First Response Foam Repair in Sacramento, California, Dennis Gutsu. Dennis just closed out 2020 with an extraordinary milestone of around $1.5 million in sales. We arranged a call with him to discuss more about his success and the mindset behind it. Since the connection was a little spotty in places, we faced some audio issues during the recording and would like to apologize to our listeners for it. Let's dive into our conversation. Hi, Dennis. Uh, thank you so much for the call. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. No problem. Thank you for having me here. You know, obviously, you know, you've worked with Repair Desk and you've worked with one of my associates before. And she did a, I believe we did a case study on you a couple of months ago, back during the pandemic. Right now, the purpose for this call, like I mentioned earlier, is that, you know, we want to be able to start our podcast. And, uh, you know, for the first episode, we wanted to be able to, like, feature you and the amazing, the amazing sales that you've done in, the, in 2020. So thank you so much for being here on the first episode. Why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. First off, uh, I want to thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. Um, as you stated, even before, uh, we did have an episode with myself and we even talked with your colleague during the pandemic and just how Repair Desk was working out. But I myself, uh, my, again, my name is Dennis. Uh, I own a store here in Sacramento. Even right now, January 4th, got a chance to open up a second store. But Overall, I've been in business now for four years. It's in California that the that the business that I have here, and uh, we're looking forward to continue moving, you know, in the right direction. No matter what comes around, whether it's the pandemic or um, any kind of situation, we look forward to, you know, continue having great success in this field. That's awesome. So, why don't you tell us a bit about how you started your business uh, back when it was new and how it's fared up until this point? Uh, absolutely. Um, so when I started, that was in 2016. Um, and what happened is when I first structured the business, I structured it as a sole prop, um, just kind of to get something going, um, you know, still being a novice in business. And eventually, while we started moving forward in 2000 and, uh, 2016, uh, so I eventually ended up structuring it into an LLC. I started to have a bigger vision for a bigger path. But uh, overall, you know, there was a lot of challenges that I came across. There was a lot of obstacles that I had to go around and jump over. And uh, just as almost any single person that can that wants to have success, you know, in their business, they can do the same thing and have these challenges in their business. But um, when when I first opened it, we opened it up in a little tiny a shack. It wasn't too big of a store. It was just to focus on repairs, but the main goal and focus was, as our phone store is called, First Response Phone Repair, uh, the main focus was to uh, repair phones. And it wasn't too much of a big plan that I had. It was just to get customers in, you know, and have that one-on-one. Got to take a look around to see uh, and I was able to see that many people were just overcharging, going crazy prices. Uh, and that's one of the things that kind of struck me because I was one of those customers that actually went out to a few stores to open up, uh, I'm sorry, to repair my my phone or even just a speaker. And it was overwhelming prices compared to compared to what the part cost. So the labor was very high. And that was actually the first initial idea that I had that maybe I can open up a phone store, maybe I can open up, you know, an electronics store. And that's where that idea gave birth. Um, But, and that's sure enough what happened in 2016, I decided to open up the store. And uh, first off, I didn't have any knowledge in it. So I myself got my business partner involved. um, And he happens to be my cousin, his name is Daniel. And he was working in electronics at Walmart during that time. So I was persuading him to, you know, let's, let's open up, let's go for a phone store. And it was just a great idea I had, but 
eventually over time he said, you know, he's going to agree with it. And he actually was the repair guy. So he was a technician. He was the repair guy. And sure enough, that's how the idea came about just for the phone store for us to open up. So I wanted to be able to ask, um, why do you think it was that, you know, when you were a customer uh, for other repair stores, you'd go in and the labor would be charged really high? Well, why do you think that disparity was there? And why did, you know, uh, why did you feel a need to fill it? Yeah, so one thing is, you know, and, and I see this today many times in, uh, in, people's, in people's businesses, uh, a lot of times they don't focus on customers and customer needs. And when I say that is uh, a lot of times when they just first open up, what are they trying to do? Their focus is pay the rent, make sure they're making enough. Uh, make sure they're making, you know, at least to be able to pass. And one thing is they started, not, the people start not to consider on, at, on volume. And what they start to consider more is any customer that comes in, I'm going to go ahead and try to make the most out of it. If it's $100 profit, if it's $200 profit. So when I came in there, I knew that that was something that was struggling in all of phone repair areas, electronic repairs. And I'm just talking about any need. Today, us as humans, what is our first initial thing? It's greed. We want more. We want more. We want more. And that's something that I believe personally is a, a way that actually draws away the success. Is because a lot of times people focus on, let me make as much as possible, but now they don't differentiate from another business. So why would a customer pick you over, another, uh, over the other store? And I see that today because I myself am in a couple, you know, groups that I get to see people type on and speak about. And a lot of times, even today, I see conversations that are being brought up about what the cost of the repair was. So overall, I see that problem now. But back, I realized that for you to be successful, you have to have something different. Walmart took that approach. Walmart ended up having what? The lowest prices. And when they had those prices, they started to drive in their customers. So there's a lot of businesses that are very successful that will focus in on making a smaller profit margin, but they will go ahead and bring in a bigger quantity of customers. And today, I, I see the fruit of that. There was times that I had to not be able to take a paycheck home just to cut the cost of the business, just to be able to make it that month, just to go to the next month. So uh, back then, when I when I when I started to realize that a lot of successful companies, that's the route they started to use. They had to make a couple dollars to just make ends meet, go through it to be able to come where they are today. And luckily, you know, and I'm blessed to see it this way. I see my businesses going this way. And again, it's because of the strategies that we take us as business owners that we want to go through. Um, but for me to go into this route, I knew that there was going to be a lot of challenges that I'm going to have to go through. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to be I wasn't going to be able to drive my Lamborghini in the first month when I just opened it up, <laughs> and so forth. And this is what people focus on. They they it's it's called instant gratification. When people focus on instant gratification, they don't see the long term path for their business. They don't have a business plan. They don't have any kind of thought what's going to happen in a three-year plan, a five-year plan, a 10-year plan, because they want it now. And then they end up losing their customers on that. They end up starting to lose, uh, to lose their reputation. Then in the end, you're, no, you're not made any different from any kind of other store. What CPR is across the street, you break, I fix, big old corporations. So there has to be something that you differentiate with. And that's something that a lot of business owners today take into consideration and they're trying to make as much as possible that when the pandemic did hit, I got to read how many people are struggling through it. And it's sad. It's sad how many people are struggling, but it's because they didn't prepare for this. And that's the reason. And I'm not talking about prepare as in financially and what they have in their bank. What I'm talking to you about prepare is now that when the tough times come and it slows down and they're going downhill, they're still staying above water. So that's a strategy that they didn't take because of the way that they structured the business in the beginning. So your advice to anyone who's starting out a new repair business would generally be don't go in blind. Try to come up with a plan first. See what you want to achieve out of this and how you're going to differentiate yourself from everything else in the market. Because there are people out there who are already established. There are people out there who have customers. You need to be able to break into that market. 
and not just break in. You need to be able to sustain yourself, which means that this isn't just going to be for the short term. This isn't just going to be to pay the bills. This has got to be long term. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because there is a lot of people today that, just as you said, they've established their customer service. They will establish their grounds. But in the end, what's happening is, yes, they own a business. But what's happening is now they're working for the business, not the business working for them. Not many business owners can come today and say that they get to wake up whatever time they want. If they want to show up to their store, they get to show up to their store. You know, if they don't want to be there today, they don't have to be here today. Not many business owners can do that. And that's because they come out and they end up doing what? They're hustling. They continue to hustle. So even though they're business owners, they're continuously, they're continuously are being active hustlers. They're hustling their customers. They're trying to make the most out of it. They're hustling every single day just to make a penny. Somebody comes out to give them an offer. Maybe it's to buy a phone. They're going to what? Lowball them like crazy because they're going to continuously try to make that end meet. And for the rest of their lives while they're hustling, they're going to stay in business and then they're going to have those tough times. But if they're trying to actively actually have a business and own a business and be a business owner, a business should not require you to be there actively or even be there nine to five. That's McDonald's. That's Walmart. That's that's any other place that requires you to be there. But if you own a business and you have to operate from nine to five, you no longer own the business. The business owns you. I wanted to ask. What you're saying is basically, you know, it is valid to a very large degree. However, I wanted to be able to know, does this factor into the sort of, you know, the sort of place where you're operating out of? Let's say, for example, you know, you're working, you're operating out of an impoverished area where, you know, you need to be able to make ends meet. And that's sort of that culture, that mindset. Does that hold true over there as well? Or are the situations going to be different? Um, it depends on the, I, I would say is it just depends on the lo- level of success that you want to, to be at. I say that is because again, if you're, you know, if you're in an area where there are more people, maybe you're in the city, of course, you're going to drive a lot more traffic, but there's also strategies that you can take because in the end, if you are trying to be that person that is making, you know, eight grand a month, 10 grand a month, six grand a month, and you don't want to hire that one employee and to end up you know, cutting your, cutting your profit to maybe 3000 a month or 2000, then yes, that's something that you're going to have to do. But as a business owner, and if you got the chance to open up this business, you should automatically know and understand that your value is a lot more greater than you hiring that one employee to run the business for you for $3,000. Mm-hmm. I myself have value. I'm, I myself, I know my value. I would not have implemented myself in the business to sit there and do repairs or make maybe making phone, uh, phone sales or maybe coming out there. I will engage with customer service when I come out here because customer service is number one. But again, for me to physically sit there just because I want to get a bigger paycheck, again, I know my value. And if I'm going to take away myself from the business, I'm going to start focusing on things of how I can grow my business. Each and every single one of us has a peak of what we're able to do in a business. We all have a cap, and that's the reason why we need to build build a team around us so that we can get those caps higher. So every single one of us has a plateau that we will eventually hit. There was a time in my life when I used to be out in in our previous store. There was a plateau that we hit, and I was consistently able to see the same profit margin each and every single month. So I ended up taking a look, and just to be able to see is, okay, where can we improve on? I pulled myself away from the business. I hired somebody else to step in to do what I was doing. I ended up taking time training them. But then when I pulled myself away, I ended up now focusing on things in the business that could use a little bit of growth. And then when it could use a little bit of growth, I started to determine that, okay, we are now making phone sales. I have made $115 in phone sales today as is. Uh, so now let me go ahead and see if I can plug in a sales associate that will focus just on phones, advertising them, the text message back to the customer, uh, whoever is inquiring about it. And now I ended up hiring that person. And during that time, I covered the cost. Today, my phone store locally sells 35 to 45 cell phones each and every single day, pandemic or not pandemic. We are selling each and every single day just 35 to 45 locally. So... For me, in the beginning, to pull somebody aside 
And for them to start to focus on these things, it took sacrifice. I had to now officially take a pay that, yes, I had to take somebody part-time, but I had to take that pay away because we were only selling three or four phones. And we were making $100 on three or four phones. But now that one employee, because of the hire that for him, was able to throw me to a certain extent. He was focusing on advertising the phones. He was focusing on communicating with the customers. And today we're selling 35 to 45 phones every single day. These numbers I give to people sometimes of how many phone sales we make locally and business partners that I know, I'm sorry, business owners that I know, I speak to them. They're, they're talking about selling. I know that that's a lot of phones that I'm selling. But again, it's always that sacrifice that we have to take as business owners because it goes back to understanding your value. And if you know your value is worth a lot more, then you know that if you make 6000 in one month overall in your business, then in the end that it's going to be worth a lot more than if you hire somebody else on, he takes on that role, and he grows it for you. Now you won't be making 6000 a month as a business owner. Now you might jump to... Uh, nine thousand, or maybe you jump to twelve thousand, or maybe ten thousand. Okay, so the way that I look at it is that maybe the reason that people sort of like shy away from you know hiring on extra help is because you know there's a lot of investment that goes into it first. They have the idea that all right, you know, new person's going to come in, we're going to have to train them, they're going to have to take some time to get running into the business that takes away from our focus. And like you mentioned, that a lot of people they think about the short term, they think about short term gains, and because they're so focused on that. They see that as a bit of a lose-lose situation for themselves because they have to train someone, they have to bring them on board, and it's going to take time. And during that time, the store is going to be doing a lot less than it was before. Their focus is going to be taken away. They're going to be bringing in less money, hopefully. And it's not going to be, you know, you're never going to know for sure whether the employee that you hired after all the training and everything was the right fit. You're never going to know that initially unless you actually put them through the bringer and, you know, go eight months down the line. So I guess that's basically what it is. How do you feel about that? So a lot of times when people look at it that way, honestly, is a lot of times because they're trying to hire that person and then they're willing to just kick their feet up on the couch and then they're not willing to invest that time into it. I've seen it personally. I've seen it firsthand myself. So from what you're speaking about, you're speaking out about 100 percent truth, how people feel. My business partner felt the same way about this when we first were talking about certain areas in our business where we can hire somebody on. So he had that same exact mentality at first. And that's a lot of things what business owners do have. They see it that way that, well, now I'm taking away from my profit. And that's something hard to take away because it's coming from my profit. Mm -hmm. And again, yes, it will be something that you have to waste and spend time with. But a lot of times, if you properly train an employee just to start doing something in particular, yes, it can take you a month. It can take you two months. But in the end, you lost two months out of the year or you can end up losing two decades because you're going to continuously do it yourself. So what would you rather lose as a business owner? And that's something that people have to break in their mentality because it is a fear driven thing that, hey, will I make enough? Hey, will I be able to? Hey, will I be able to? And the one thing is, is if you're not willing to risk. I mean, I, I, I personally don't see how a bit person can be in business because even opening up a business in the beginning, they took that risk. It was a risk they took to, to actually open the business. And if they've gotten that far, then why should they stop? And that's the one thing is, is what happens is they continue to climb that ladder. They climb that ladder and they just stop in the middle of that ladder. And in the end, you just don't know how much higher you can go. So one thing is, is again, uh, I wouldn't say that a person should just start hiring people random. But they should have a plan of where they're going to utilize them and where they can take it from. For instance, I have a customer service, uh, customer service uh, uh, reception desk that, that they work at, right? I have two receptionists. So the profit that I consider for the receptionist, I better be making enough in sales on my floor from accessories, from screen protectors, from product itself. And that's how I determine how many receptionists will I need. So I do, I, what I will do is I'll start to divide all these things. When I start to look at repair area, I need to make sure that I'm making enough repairs while I'm growing so I can plug somebody in. Even if I have to take a little bit of a cut, but now I'm able to see that there's still going to be growth. 
So I don't go in blindfolded, just randomly start hiring people. But again, you have to determine where will these funds be coming from at the same time. And if there is an area, then they can go ahead and do it. But for those people that are just starting up, a lot of times is they're making a pretty good amount of money. Yes, they might not be where they want to be, but because they're a single person running a store, you know, they're probably paying a thousand dollars in rent. Again, depending on where you're at, I was paying a lot more. I'm in Sacramento. California is a very expensive state to live in. And a lot of these people are paying very little. And being honest, about two weeks ago, I was on a chat on Facebook, uh, repair desk, uh, I'm sorry, uh, cell phone repair shop talk. And I got, and somebody asked a question, what are you guys paying for rent? First off, in those, in that question alone, I was able to see, I didn't answer. I didn't want to indulge in that kind of conversation, but I saw that I would have been the highest person paying rent alone. And when I saw that, there was some people that started to ask the same question about what do you guys charge for this screen replacement? What do you guys charge for this? What do you guys charge for that? And I started to think about those things. It's just those numbers don't add up. You're paying $400 a month for rent, but you're charging somebody for like an iPhone X $199 for a repair. And when I go there, I, I'll start to look at numbers and how much they're making. And that shows that they're starting to focus on a profit margin of $80 to about $120 profit margin. That's a, to me personally, that's a ridiculous number. Hands down, that is to each and every single business owner. If you are trying to make $100 on a device profit, $80, that is just hands down the most ludicrous idea I've ever heard. And I focus on here at my store. If it's a screen replacement, most of them will be about $30 profit. Now, when people hear that, I even take a look on, on some people that are doing it out of their garage and they're, and, they're, and they're repairing phones and they're still making a higher profit margin than what I am. I will consider the time frame because, of course, you know, if it's a Samsung device where it takes about an hour, hour and a half, then I will pick up the profit margin a little bit just because I don't want to go in negative while my employee is repairing the device. But on average, when I'm having 40 repairs per day, here at the store locally without special orders, without anything. And then we're talking about somebody that just made $150 even on one repair, but they have four customers who in reality is making more money. So that's the focus they have. They might get those four customers, but when I'm talking to you about 40 customers, three technicians, you know, uh, two receptors, three sales floor reps, and then one person that, that will continuously uh, be a manager monitoring everything in the end is just what they're doing is once again, they're hustling because a person just randomly needed that phone replaced for whatever reason. They might have been crossing the country, going somewhere. They were stopping by. They broke their phone. They needed it replaced. And that's the only reason why they stopped by them. But what are you doing to actually make that customer service connection? Is that customer going to come back? How many times do you have a repeat customer? And that's why you need to. Know your customer, the KYC rule. Banks use that till today. It's called the KYC rule. And a lot of these, a lot of these businesses here, they don't even have a KYC. They don't even have a customer, a repeat customer. Because it will be a random customer that comes in because of the prices. And sometimes they'll call around and they're like, that's too much. Or in the end, no, I didn't have a great experience. You know, they're still charging the same as, you know, Joe next door. I'll just try him out. I have customers that are dedicated here. Last year alone, I had 7,500 new customers that walked into my building for last year alone. So with each and every single one of those customers, I start to see repeats. I start to see them coming in to purchase some accessories. I start to come on in as to start seeing them, you know, for, for just uh, questions that they're asking. Sometimes they'll come in for multiple repairs. Then customers will come out like, oh yeah, by the way, uh, this and this person referred me because you guys are doing great. And personally, I know that myself. But again, a lot of business owners need to think about these things of, are these customers coming back or is it just a one-time hitter? Do you think it would be a good idea for business owners to sort of put themselves in their customers' shoes? Maybe that gives them a better perspective since, you know, that's how you mentioned that, you know, back when you didn't have a business, you'd go in as a customer and you felt that need. Do you think that's something that more business owners should do? 
Absolutely. Uh, um, one thing is that I personally teach each and every single one of my employees is before you give an answer to the customer, it is important that you put yourself in, them, in their shoes and with, with the customer regarding this. So one thing is, is what I, what I end up always telling my employees is before you make a decision, it is very, very important that you always put yourself in the customer's shoes. I want to give you a perfect example. A couple of weeks ago, my receptionist did make a mistake. Um, iPhone 7 has a very big issue with the IC chip. And what happens is, you know, your phone can be working right now. Once a customer comes in, you disconnect the battery. You reconnect the battery. A lot of times the device will run a diagnostic on itself, but it could have had an issue already in the past. And as soon as it detects that it has an IC problem, the ear speaker and loudspeaker stop working. So, and that IC chip that went out on the phone, and it's an iPhone 7, Apple talks about it. It's on their website, so people know. And one thing is, is when, my, when a customer came in, they just wanted a basic screen replacement, their, their loudspeaker and and their uh, and the ear speaker, I'm sorry, their microphone and their ear speaker was working perfectly fine. When we did a screen replacement, it ended that the customer uh, IC chip was not working because it was already previously bad. And sure enough, the customer was a little upset. They wanted to speak to a manager. My manager came out and he decided to speak to the customer. And in the end, he, he kind of gave this broad little answer about, well, you know, sevens have this issue. It's not something that we did. Um, and this is a problem. It's even showing on the Apple website. You know, there's not much what we can do. If you take a look in this little corner, somewhere hidden, who knows if you can find it. We even have an article about it and all these things. And I happened to actually be at that store that day. And uh, one thing is the customer got really upset. She stated clearly, she said, I'm a Yelper. She was crying. She said, you guys messed up my phone. Now you guys don't want to fix it. And Again, that's a natural instinct because we as owners and we as people in business, we do know this. We know that this is not a problem that we actually occurred ourselves. But to save the customer, what are you going to do as a business owner or even you as a manager or an employee that is running a store? What are you going to do? So since I have micro soldering techs here, the IC chip costs about $5. So what I did is I eventually pulled my manager aside. I gave him, she was out there while she was crying during this incident. She said, take off my screen, give me my refund and let me, you know, let me go. And then she stated, I'm a Yelper. This is bad customer service. And she was upset and she had every single right to be. If my receptionist informed her that this is something that can happen, she would have been prepared and she would have made the proper decision. And since we didn't inform her that this is a possibility of something can happen, we as owners need to take responsibility. And this is something that I always see people in different businesses because now they try to smooch as much money as possible. And what is the first initial thought that they do? Well, let's go ahead and tell them a price. And that's exactly what my manager did here. He went out there and he said, well, you know, the IC chip replacement costs uh, $89.99. It takes about one day. We can have it possibly done for you today, so on and so forth. And she was furious. So again, I came out there, you know, I pulled him aside and I, and I said, I want you to put yourself in this position. What if today you took your car and you took it to the shop to get your tires changed? And for whatever reason, the, 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 the person that was changing your tires knew that when he takes off your tires, randomly your transmission goes bad and he never told you anything about it. And once you were done, he put the tires back on. It happens that your transmission goes out. Would you be upset at him or would you not if he never informed you about that and he knew what the problem was? And those are some kind of decisions that people have to make. There's sometimes that they have to make this cut so that they can gain that customer. We ended up eventually taking that phone for free and actually going ahead and doing the replacement. But again, that's the mentality that business owners constantly have. And they stand there firm, believing that it's not a good hit. There's times that a business needs to take that's going to be a good hit. Even if you can't do an in-house IC chip replacement because it requires micro soldering. But in the end, what is the benefit that you will be receiving? Even for us, if we allow that to happen, number one, we would have lost a customer. Number two, we would have lost the profit on the screen because she was asking us to put out the old screen. Number three, it's the one 
100 rule. One customer tells 10 customers, 10 customers tell 10 customers, that's 100, that's 100 customers, and all of a sudden your reputation is starting to go down because of that one customer. And that's what a lot of business owners don't take into consideration today, and they don't take into consideration to go full on 100% for their customer, and they never put them in their shoes. It could have been their last $60, $50 that they're spending to get that screen replaced to be able to get to work. But in the end, just because we want to make an additional $40, $50, $80, we're, we're not willing to actually step into that customer's shoes. And we're not willing to understand that, wait, hey, wait a second, this customer might back, come back again to, you know, in a year, maybe in six months. But think about your clientele, how much it builds up. That's pretty insightful, actually. How did the end of that story go, basically? Was that, was that customer a repeat one? Two days later, she came out with her husband and they purchased accessories. That's amazing. I was in here two days later. I was able to see her. I haven't been I haven't been technically at this store for a while. This happened about five months ago. I did take a look at her ticket thanks to Repair Desk um, since I use you guys for everything. And I was able to, to track her down. I have seen that she has come out here. She actually purchased a new phone with us. So... She purchased a new phone, but two days later, after this entire incident, after saying that she's going to Yelp review us, which is definitely going to be a probably one-star review, uh, losing her as a customer, she ended up actually coming back. She purchased accessories for, for a phone. I'm not sure. Maybe it was her husband's phone. Um, and I saw her physically. And then when I went to take a look at the tickets, I was able to see that she purchased a phone from us. So two times she came back in the last four months. And this is a lot of things that a lot of business owners don't consider. Because they're looking in the now time, now time. If I lose now, I'm going to lose my $5 on that IC chip, not considering that they just made, you know, $70 on the screen replacement or whatever amount it is. So technically speaking, you just profited $65. You're not, you're not losing. And that's what they're always having is, is, is always, is the, is the cup half empty or is the cup half full? And that's what they look at us all the time is, man, I can make more. I can make more. I can make more. But in the end, you might have made more today, but tomorrow you made less because that customer will never come back to you again. And that's the big old repercussion that people are having in their businesses and why their businesses are starting to lose out customers slowly and slowly each and every single time. So, Dennis, obviously, you know, this sort of stuff comes with experience. You've had to deal with situations like this where you knew what sort of action to take uh, you know, on the spot. And that's how you learn that this is how you're supposed to set your operating practices. What sort of message do you have for people who haven't been through those experiences? And how do you feel that they can sort of like go through with that? Um, one thing is I want to say this is I'm a dropout. So if I'm able to do something, any single person can. And that is plain and simple. And and when I say a dropout, I'm I'm not necessarily talking about in high school. So I dropped out of college because I was going to become an RN. So my, my vision in life was to become an RN. And over time, I started to realize that that's not mine. One thing is, is if you don't have the experience because you didn't go through college, because you didn't have the knowledge behind, because you didn't have the, the, the connects, maybe you didn't have the, you know, the role models, my biggest suggestion to you is then listen to the customers and listen what their demand is. But you also must find somebody that will be a role model in your life. And I'm not talking about in every single aspect. I'm talking about everything in general. You need to have a role model in marriage. You need to have a role model that is specifically in business. You need to have a role model that knows in that area. And not just randomly finding somebody out there. But take a look in those areas of life if you want to be successful in, their, in those areas. Because they're speaking out of experience. And they've learned on that experience. And now you can learn off of their experience. And that's the one thing is that a lot of times what people are doing is they're learning off of their own experience. I did that in the beginning. And the first two years, my business was not going that well. So then I started to, you know, look into, into podcasts. I started to look into books. I started to even put a role model. I have a role model today. He is absolutely not a business owner. He's one of my role models in business. He's absolutely not a business business. Uh, he doesn't own any businesses. But the one thing that he does is he works with people. And that's what he set his goal on. And he went through classes to work with people. Your customers are people. 
So every time I have some kind of decisions that I maybe was thinking of making with a customer, maybe this, I will always give him a call and I'll talk to him. His name is Stan. And I'll talk to him about it. And I'll say, hey, Stan, this and this situation happened. This is how I proceeded. This is what I did. How do you see it? And he will give me from his side. And now he starts to, to, to grow my mind in different areas to see different areas. So the biggest thing, what I, what I would highly suggest for people to do is find those role models that can help you grow your business. That can help you in, in any part of the life uh, of overall, but especially in business. If you want your business successful, we as humans, we don't have us personally. We don't have all the resources. We don't have all the, all the ability to research it. We don't have all the time in the world. But there is somebody else that already did all that for you. And all what you have to do is find those people, work with them, and figure out how in the same time as you can implement it where they help you and you help them. And today I also have role models that are in business as well. And again, you have to level this out on that success because myself is a lot of the things that I learned was because there's a computer in front of us. The wonderful thing is like just like you and I today, we're not communicating from a cup with a with a long little, you know, uh, a wire going through it. It's right, right through a cell phone. It has all the answers. And I found those answers many times when I first was opening up the store. I would type up the question. There would be all sorts of different areas, and it guides me towards the right area. It might not give me the answer, but it starts to make me think in a different way. And that's a lot of times what I started to do is I'd go on YouTube. I'd type up, you know, customer service uh, experience, or I would type, you know, something random. But you have to set your goals to grow because if you're not going to set your goals, you're going to continuously go off of yourself, your emotions. Maybe this customer didn't look at you right. Maybe this customer – you know, was a thief once and you caught him and now you just want to confront him, you know, and, and there's a lot of things that we will do based on emotions. Maybe we just had a bad experience with this customer. Now we're going based off of emotions. So for those people that, you know, maybe even went to college and got a business degree, I still don't have a business degree. For maybe for those people that, you know, even took 10 years in college going through different, you know, fields, or even for those people that didn't, it's very important that you continuously are searching for that research uh, resources, whether it's online, whether it's just having great communication with people that are, are in the same field, or maybe it's, you know, reading a book or listening to a podcast. There's Dave, Dave Ramsey. He talks about debt all the time. There's many people out there that will help you succeed in the area that you're in. You just want to have to, you just, you just, you just have to want to uh, go in that area and, and actually start to, start to learn because again, each and every single one of us, like I said in the beginning, we have a cap where we will eventually just top out from all of our ideas, all of our you know research that we've ever did in life. And now we have to start to think about outside of the box, something that we don't even know. And that's my biggest thing for, for people. Okay, so do you think that the aspect of community within the repair shop industry should be more prevalent because I feel that that would be a great place to look for sort of role models. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Absolutely. One thing is, is, you know, you want to hook up with as many that are in the same area as possible. And not only that, Facebook has a chat, you know, cell phone repair shop talk. I've been in that community for quite some time now. And you can always just, you know, take a look at different businesses, what they're su succeeding on, and what other businesses are not succeeding on. And you can always implement it into your business. But just as you stated, is it's very pivotal that you are in that community talking. Because in the end, if you're just in the little bubble, you just will never see outside of the box. And you won't see outside and be able to actually make the proper, uh, proper decisions. And I, I do agree with what you're saying is it's very important. Okay, but there is also a sort of... Um... There's a bit of a difficulty over here as well. Naturally, it's a good thing to be a part of a community because you get all that resource, all that experience. You get to talk a lot. But then again, there's that whole element about it being online, someone being distant, someone you're not interfacing with you know, on a regular basis or face-to-face. Face-to-face uh, -face interaction actually has very vastly different uh, results. You feel a lot more comfortable. You feel a lot more genuine. Because online, you can talk about anything. But when you're talking to a person face-to-face, -face, you got to keep it real. It's absolutely, you know, it's a completely different feeling. So how do you feel that repair shop owners should sort of like make their real-world interactions based along those? So 
right now, my store right now has communication and even I myself. First off, a lot of times we look at it as what? We're competitors. Whether, whether they're across you know, the street, whether they're next door, we're competitors. And as soon as we start to think in this way, we instantly and automatically become enemies. So my thing is, is you have to take a look at people that are around you and you have to work together. And then you start to build a relationship. My store here in Rancho Cordova is working with a repair store or used to work with, with a repair store that's about 10 minutes away. They had something that we didn't have. And then we started having communication. Then we started having a relationship. Now we started having a friendship. So instead of us working against each other, we started to work with each other. So, and it's very important that you do set yourself up like that because again, virtual is one thing. Reality is when you're standing next to each other and you are going you know, through the same problems and you're face to face and you are talking with that person and you guys are making some kind of achievements. And it's very important that yes, you do have people in this area. If you don't agree and you don't want to, find somebody a little bit further out. Make some kind of connection. They might give you an idea that you never knew and you might give them an idea that they never knew. And it works both ways. But again, you know, reaching out is the most important part. And if you, if, if you reach out as an owner and you want to just talk to another owner, hey, uh, I'm here in Sacramento or wh whatever city, you know, you, uh, anybody's in. I'm out here. I, you know, I just wanted to introduce myself. I've been in the business, you know, this is this much going on. Offer them something. This is some kind of service that we do. Is it something that you'd be interested in? And start something and start somewhere. But again, you don't want to become enemies with the people that are around you. Because in the end, those people can also hurt your business. When you start becoming enemies, they can start to spew things that are lies about your business. And there will be those gullible business, I'm sorry, customers that will start to believe that. And once you start to become enemies, you start fighting against the whole world with you. And and that's why it's important to get people on your side, work as a team, even if they're in the same same community. There's things that they're doing that probably you're not doing, and that's what they're succeeding on, and vice versa. Um, because a person in a repair field won't just specifically focus on one repair, and that's it. They'll have multiple things that they grow their business around. I, I even know people that are in, in repairs, but mainly they're focusing on online. I have a soldering tech that isn't too far away. And he's focusing on eBay specifically, but he's a repair store here in Sacramento. His doors are open. He doesn't have a large clientele of customers coming in. And he was one of the guys that really helped us out before we started to proceed in the soldering area. We started to work with him and, and, and he was specifically focusing on eBay and he was specifically focusing on soldering things from eBay. That was his bread and butter. But again, we're in the same field. And we ended up being great, great, you know, friends. And, and again, and today we're able to talk about these things. And Jose and I, we, you know, we have a relationship. And, and, and instead of us now, you know, turning towards each other, or maybe a customer coming to his door and he's like, oh, yeah, huh. oh, first response corner prayer. Oh, yeah, these guys, oh, man, they're garbage. Oh, everybody says it. And now he's even referring customers to us for things that he's not able to do. And that's the one thing that the beauty of it of when you have these people that are local, not just online and virtual. And, you know, you can be a keyboard warrior or whoever you want to be. And, and it's important that you have these relationships here because in the end, it's the community that's going to make it or break it for you. It's a community here locally that will actually help you grow your business or they won't. That's a very noble way to look at it because not a lot of people would focus on their competitors as being someone that they can relate with, someone that they can be friends with. And I believe that's part of your success. Absolutely. One thing is uh, you definitely don't want to be higher than your competitors when it comes to prices. You still want to be lower to succeed. But at the same time, you don't want to be that person that just has absolutely no relationship. And, and here, there's a, lot of phone, there's a lot of phone stores that talk about us, our success. Um, there's even... Even in general, there's I didn't know about this, but I, I guess there's a chat here in Sacramento with the metro stores. I'm not sure if every district does it, um, but but they have a metro store. And there's a lot of people that talk about us. And the reason I know that is because uh, 
There's a master agent that works with Metro, and he also works here for activations for prepaid services. And since that's one of the services we offer here, he talks to us all the time. I have a relationship with him, and he was able to really turn a lot of things around just because of that one person. He was able to turn things around for us and a couple Metro stores because there was Metro stores that didn't like us. They didn't like our prices that we were having on phones. They didn't like that many customers were coming out here and activating their devices, leaving from Metro. And there was things that he was able to do to talk with them. But again, if you want to have that success and if you want to you want to be able to have great customer service, it's not just focusing on yourself and your wallet and what you can be in, but you focus on the community. What does the community want? How can I help the community? How can I be better than the next guy? But at the same time, with also communicating with people that are around you so that they can also help you out. Because just like this gentleman that I was talking to you about, Mike Rosadery, he ended up making profit from us. He wasn't doing it for free. But at the same time, yeah, we might have been charging our customer just a little bit higher, but we saved our customer. And now that today we are ready to, to be the soldering techs of even working on micro soldering on their devices, we gave them no reason to leave. And that's the resources that I'm talking about that people should be making with their local repair communities. Because in the end, not only will you build a relationship with them, but also they can help you out and they can help you grow your business in the long term. Not to me, but in the long term, they will actually help you grow. Speaking of relationships, how do you maintain a positive and strong relationship inside your store? with your own staff members, with your technicians and your receptionists and anyone else that's there? Uh, recognize, recognizing, recognizing, recognizing. So you have to recognize, first of all, your employees when they're doing good. You cannot be that person that only brings them into the office whenever they did something bad. Number two is no matter who you are, you always want to hear about yourself. And by that, I'm talking about people here today, they want to be recognized. One important thing that we do here, especially is when it's somebody's one year anniversary with us, we make sure everybody knows about it. When it's their birthday, we make sure that they get fed, that they have a party and that they get recognized. So we make them feel comfortable. And the one thing is, is now when you are taking them into the office, because you do need to have a talk with them about something. Now they understand that it's constructive criticism instead of you just going out there because, oh, that's the owner. Oh, once again, I messed up. Oh, he just wants to blast me again. So one thing is, is you have to recognize your employees when they are doing bad, uh, when they are doing good. But also when they're doing bad, they're now willing to accept it because you also show that you care about them. And if you don't show that you care about them, their birthday comes by, you don't say anything to them. You don't even text them. Maybe in general, as a matter of fact, I actually just had an employee that is today is the second week and she's sitting uh, quarantined due to COVID. Uh, so sure enough, I messaged her on Sunday night. Hey, and I just wrote her name. I said, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Is everything OK with you? Is there anything that you need? Again, it's that feeling. So sure enough, she texted me back. And the first thing she wanted to make it clear of, hey, you know, thank you so much for checking in. Uh, I'm feeling a lot better. I still don't, you know, I still can't taste, so on and so forth. And and I told her, I said, well, let's go ahead and give you another week off. Make sure to take the test. We want to be safe. But again, it's making sure that you're showing that your employees that you care about them as much as you care about yourself. Well, I really hope that, you know, your employee who recently got struck with the quarantine, she makes it out well because that is really a frightful thing to be had. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why we have to follow proper uh, procedures of what the what the county is asking us to do. And again, she seems like she's doing very well. She's not going through any kind of any kind of, uh, you know, hard breathing or, or any symptoms. Uh, so she she definitely will be fine. But again, it's that showing that you care about them as much as you care about yourself. Absolutely. That's how you keep a, maintain a positive a positive environment with your employees. Absolutely. And the way that I see it is that when she eventually does come back, there'll be a lot more motivation to work. There'll be a lot more connection with the business and with the people that are in the business. She'll be in much better spirits than it would be if she were working some other job where people didn't even care. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And, th and that's and that's the most important part is because when they feel like they're a part of your company, they feel like they're growing the company with you. So a person that comes here in here and they're just focusing on a nine to five, give me my paycheck, I'm out of here. They're just as good as any kind of person that, you know, wants to come in and get out. But when a person has been invested into, they are they know and they have been shown that they are cared for. Now they're willing to actually take on these burdens of a business and they will do that with a smile on their face rather than with with just being upset that my boss the one that told me I need to do this. Oh, I hate him or her. I can't stand them. Now they're trying to grow the company because they know that this company cares for me as well. And again, you know, this is all because, you know, you had planned for this. You had thought that this is something that you wanted to do and you didn't just go in blindly. Absolutely. Yeah, it takes a lot of uh, a lot of people to sit there, think about these things. It takes a lot of time to, you know, put everything together. And, and, and again, sometimes you don't have the whole plan. You, you, you build it as you go. But it's important to just continuously focus on that area because, again, we can't always determine what the future is going to bring us. But it's important that at least we continue to go in the same path and continue to move forward. Right. Human connection, basically, and the foresight to be able to work together and make things run even when you can't see them. So that's great. And seems like First Response Phone Repair is doing a great job at it because you've had an amazing 2020 and 2021 is looking to be even better than that. So good luck to everything in the future. And I really hope that, you know, you take you take it forward miles beyond. Yes. Thank you very much. We had a great year last year. We are moving forward with even a bigger year. I'm excited to you know be here with you to have this opportunity to talk to you. And uh, also, it just it's an honor to, to be able to have, be on this podcast. So I hope we are able to have another one maybe in the future and see how the second store is going. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd love it. Absolutely love it. So why don't you tell us, you know, before we sign off, uh, tell us a bit about uh, how people can find you. Yeah, absolutely. So we actually are on Facebook as well. Uh, it's FR Phone Repair. You can also go ahead and find us on Instagram. We also go FR Phone Repair. If we were to write out our whole name, it's a little long. Our website, the same exact thing, FR Phone Repair. But then if you're looking for us and maybe you're even in this area, um, we're located in Sacramento, California, first response phone repair. You can always find us on Google, see you in person, and it would be definitely an honor, you know, if you ever decide to link up with us. We have Facebook, we have Instagram, uh, or even in person, you can come on now. All right. Thank you so much once again, Dennis. It's been really insightful and really great to be able to talk to you about all of this. Yeah, thank you very much. It's staticking a little bit, but thanks enough to, to be here today and have this communication with you. Hopefully, you know, we'll be able to do this again in the future, and we'd love to have you on board for a future episode. Yes, let's plan for in the future. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you once again. And there you have it. Dennis's foresight, commitment, consideration, and work ethic has brought him tremendous success so far. First Response Phone Repair is looking to do even better this year, and we wish them all the best. That wraps up our first episode. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>